Well, good morning and hello, everyone. Welcome to another special episode of Philosophy for Living on Earth, coming to you live from the Ayn Rand Institute. This is a weekly video series where we explore big questions about life and our world today and proposals for answering those questions by applying the ideas of Ayn Rand. Uh, though for the last few weeks, uh, we've been putting a lot of attention and focus on the, the, the world health crisis that, we've, that many of us have been dealing with. We've had a series of discussions about how to think about the pandemic philosophically, economically, legally, and today we are hoping to zoom in on some important psychological aspects uh, of the current situation. Our topic is dealing with stress during the pandemic. And I'd like to introduce to you now uh, two guests of ours who are, who are specialists on psychology, uh, who have lifelong careers dedicated to therapy and psychological research. And they're going to share with us today some of uh, the wisdom they've acquired on this topic. Uh, Dr. Edwin Locke is the Dean's Professor of uh, Motivation and Leadership, uh, Dean's Professor Emeritus of Motivation and Leadership at the University of Maryland. He's internationally known for his research and writings on work motivation and philosophy of science and has received numerous scholarly awards. He has given talks and courses at many objectivist conferences. And uh, thank you for joining us today, Ed. Thank you. And Dr. Ellen Kenner is a clinical psychologist and host of the nationally syndicated radio talk show, The Rational Basis of Happiness. She and Dr. Locke uh, co-authored The Selfish Path to Romance, a comprehensive guide to finding and nurturing romantic relationships inspired by the ideas of Ayn Rand. And give me just one minute because I'm going to go ahead and stop that screen share so we can both, uh, we can see both of you better. And I also have to deal with one quick technical problem there. Okay, so thank you again, Ellen and Ed uh, for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. So this is this, this COVID-19 pandemic virus that we are all now dealing with uh, both health-wise and also economically uh, is affecting pretty much everybody in the world. There are many people now, uh, presumably many of them in our audience today, who are under some form of quarantine because of it, whether they're whether it's because they themselves uh, are dealing with health issues or because they don't want to expose themselves to it. And I think that it, it goes without saying that uh, many in our audience are dealing with increased levels of stress and anxiety. And stress is the main topic I think we wanted to talk about today. So uh, what can you tell our audience to begin with about what stress is? What is stress? What's the nature of stress? Where does it come from? All right, well, stress is the result of perceived threat. It can be physical. It can be a self-esteem issue. It can be harm to loved ones. But in all cases, it threatens something that's an important value to you, including the value of yourself. So to cope with stress, you need to do two interrelated things, thinking, and actions in order to attain as much control as you possibly can to deal with a threat. Now, we all know there's no yet proven pills or anything that help prevent or cure it. There is no uh, uh, in, uh, virus uh, um, uh, uh, shots you can get. Uh, they, we will have them, but they're not here yet. So let me talk about five things you can control right now as a starting point. And then Ellen will continue with a lot of other things that take quite a bit of thought. Number one, social isolation. Why? Because it's spread by droplets in the air from other people. So you really need to stay home. Uh, with your family if they live with you and not contact other people unless you absolutely have to 
such as possibly grocery shopping. So stay home, take the isolation concept seriously because that's right now your best protection. Number two, hand washing or sanitizer. It can be spread not only by droplets, but by contact with your hands and your hands touching your face based on things you touch that have parts of the virus on them. Uh, hand washing for 20 seconds is probably the single best treatment. Sanitizer is also very good. And again, don't touch your face until after you've totally washed your hands if there's any sense you've come in contact with anything bad. Third, what about masks? Uh, at first, everyone was told, baloney, we don't need masks if you're not a healthcare worker. The opinion is now changing to saying, well, maybe you do. And of course, there's better masks and worse masks. Uh, and it's very hard to get masks, but keep in mind the possibility that you can get them and they would be helpful. Number four, daily exercise. I strongly recommend daily exercise. And even if there was no virus, it's a good thing to exercise your body and brain every single day. And it Im improves your immune system and it improves your mood. Exercise <coughs> can reduce anxiety. So my wife and I go for a walk every single day, plus a, another walk, walking the dog. So very important. And number five, it's very important to get good sleep. Again, generally true. Uh, sleep also improves your mood and your immune system. Throughout my life, I have found the most, uh, the main thing that causes me to get sick is not getting enough sleep uh, after a night or two. So I've learned this over the years. I always try to get as much healthy sleep, eight hours of the like, as you can. So those five things you can do, they're in your control, and you can do them right now, every day. So if, 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 I, uh, if I understand part of what you're saying here is that stress is a response to a threat. Part of what that threat is, is the threat of feeling out of control. And so the more things that you can do that are actually in your control, the more you're, you're able to deal with that stress. They're out of control because there's harm out there that can hurt you. Yeah. So yes, the more actions you can take and the more thinking, which Ellen will talk about in detail. So actions and thinking and thinking plus actions are the way. And someday there'll be a, a virus protector, uh, but we don't have it yet. But in the meantime, there are a lot of things we can do. So uh, Ellen, can, can you add anything uh, to this this uh, discussion, oh. especially about the, the thought aspect as opposed to the action aspect? Oh, oh definitely. I think uh, I made a few props here, but what we're dealing with right now is, can you see this? Yes. Question mark. It's a fill in the blank. It's like, what is, uh, we have so much uncertainty on so many front and fronts, and we have huge values at stake. We have our life, our health, we have family members, we have our kids maybe at home, we have them underfoot, and how do you make it not feel like they're underfoot when they are? You may have to work from home. And so basically you're sitting there with a paper like this with, I don't know if you can see that, but tons mm -hmm. of question marks. And so how do you manage that? How do you manage this enormity of the stress well, one thing to know is that it's a normal response. You want to be very gentle to yourself. You want to be very good to yourself. It's a normal response to a very bizarre situation that we're all in. I mean, I, don't, I can't even, I, I say to Harris all the time, Harris is my husband, this is, this is bizarre. And so how do you manage that? Um, well, I could jump, I could, I'd like to go into one skill, if that's okay. Sure. Um, one is, um, it, it really ranges. People go from thinking, I wanna give you the range of what I've heard. I've heard people saying, this is the way I'm going to die. I just know it. 
you know, somebody's older, this is the way I'm going to die. So on one end of the range, it's, it's all over. On the other, I'm stir crazy. I'm just so bored with staying home. I can't, there's only so much you can do. I asked an elderly doctor who lives in the condo across from us how he's managing it. And he says, I'm aging. <laughs> I mean, that's that is. And then on the best case scenario, I spoke with somebody and I have their words here. He said, I'm not worried about finances. The economy will come back. We have enough to help us through that. We want to help our employees too. At home, we shop, we get the food, we get the necessities. We're relaxed. We do some spring cleaning. The main thing I have now is time. I read books, I relax, I watch Netflix, I chill, I exercise. Um, I'm not even thinking about the end or worried about it. I, I make my home feel like home. I've ordered lots of supplies. This is what they said, Nespresso coffee, to take toilet paper and Lysol. He said, at the beginning, I watched all the news all the time. The entire world was imploding. Now I limit it. I have concern for families and friends. A friend is about to give birth any day and I have family in Italy. And the, so what I'm pointing out is there a range, there's a range from, I feel like I'm going to die to I'm on, um, I'm on a vacation, you know, an unplanned vacation. And so I just want to give this skill. I call it the, the range. Can you see it? I yes. hope it's not reverse. Okay, so when in, whenever anyone hears some bad news, like I once got a mammogram where they said you have very dense tissue, I'm over here on this line, the worst case scenario, I'm going to die, right? That's my fear. And what's the best case scenario? I'm not thinking about that. But I want to train myself to, if I'm going to live at this end of the line, I darn well better learn to figure out what the best case scenario outcome could possibly be is that I don't have breast cancer. And then there's some place in the middle, there might be a lump, but I'll survive and I'll be fine. So I, in times of crisis, I try to live between the 50% and the 100%. When I find myself dipping down to the worst case scenario, I catch it. I hear those catastrophic thoughts. Oh my God, what if we have a depression? How will we eat? What if we run out of toilet paper? And I don't say that jokingly, but kind of sort of, because that was my concern during the Obama years. Um, so I try to always live in this. I try to, whatever is within my control, I try to live here. So um, that's one skill, and I'll pause for a moment. Okay. I, as just as a, as another data point, um, I mean, one I, I suspect that some people in our audience aren't even to the point of uh, worrying about these catastrophes because they're. I mean, some people have lots of time on their hands, but some people have even less time on their hands because they're. Uh, they're 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 dealing with even more at work. They're trying to uh, oh, save yeah. their business from oh, collapsing. Absolutely, absolutely. And they they definitely need to be very gentle with themselves. If they if they're feeling on overload, they need to break it down and say, okay, what are the key values at stake here? Write them down. Uh, Jean Maroney has wonderful skills for doing that on ThinkingDirections.com. But write down what your um, what the deepest values at stake are. Is it finances? Is it that my all of my life savings are going to go? What is going through my mind now that's generating this flood of emotion? And it may be, I can't think right now. Then you need to take a break. You need to be good to yourself, get some fresh air, not to avoid addressing it, but to be able to have the mental focus, the mental frame, uh, space to be able to say, what's one small step I could take? That gives you the efficacy. Like Ed was saying, you need to feel like you have control over something. So whether it's ordering supplies for work or, or making a phone call, you need to do something to give yourself the feedback that you can handle it or at least start to handle it. So uh, one of the challenges that's unique to this situation, whether you're dealing with more work stress or too little work 
is that most of us are having to do it all from home. And uh, this is not our usual setting for everything in life. Uh, in many cases, it means we're living in close quarters. It means parents are having to watch their children uh, even while they're doing work. Uh, are there, uh, do you have any uh, strategies that you would recommend for uh, for dealing with this kind of cabin fever and living in close quarters and all while trying to live the rest of one's life? Oh, absolutely. Um, here is one very cute note. This was on Fox News. I don't think it was cute for the mother when it happened. I'll just show it to you so you can see the handwriting. And this is from Ben 316 2020 Home to School. It is not going good. My mom's getting stressed out. My mom is really getting confused. We took a break so that my mom can figure this stuff out. And I'm telling you, it is not going good. So that's, and the mother said that she feels dead. And, um, and I spoke with my daughter. My daughter has a four-year-old and she's got one-year-old twins, plus her husband works at home. So they're in that very confined area. Her, her, her husband has to go upstairs during the day to work, but he's at the ready to help her if he's not in a con on a conference call. Um, she has learned how to manage the twins and with her four-year-old, she said she would structure the day and it would fall apart and she'd feel so frustrated. And she'd go online with other parents and she'd see they're all frustrated and they're all giving advice like, you can take a tour of the zoo, you can go to, to a museum online, like all of these virtual authors who have written books for kids are reading them now online. And she said, but the problem is mom, everyone would feel guilty, they feel overloaded. So I just go with the flow. I watch my son, the four-year-old's mood and see what will make it a good day for all of us at home. And I let go of some of the standards I have and some of the rules I've had um, without having chaos, but just to have a, a nice emotional climate at home. Uh, Ed, anything you wanna add to that? Well, um, think of things you can do at home to make you happy. I think one of the huge elements here is pleasure in the whole realm of art. By that I mean everything, television, movies, music, dancing, opera, operetta. Uh, uh, art, art is fuel for the soul. So it's not, it's there for contemplation, for giving you happiness. So I recommend try to do things in the realm of art that really, really, uh, make you happy. Uh, for instance, I, I like a lot of realms of art. I love reading. Uh, I love books. I love certain TV. I love certain humor. Uh, I like certain plays. And I like music. The other night I was in the middle of uh, waking up and falling asleep again. I was thinking of a favorite um, song that I've always liked, several hundred years old. It's called Drink to Me Only With Thine Eyes, and I Will Pledge With Mine. It's a very beautiful tune with a beautiful romantic message. And so I decided to go online, say, I wonder if I can find somebody singing this. Sure enough, there were about six people who sang this song back, going back to the 50s. So I went through all of them, and I picked one that I love, Patricia Hammond, and it was beautifully done, and it is loved it so much. So then I called Ellen and I said, I found this great song. So Ellen said, well, I'm going to check it out. So she called back and said, I checked it out, but I like another singer better than yours. <laughs> Laura Wright said, great. But what is the show? You've got to play favorites and you have to spoil yourself by indulging in favorites in all realms of art because it's a source of pleasure and it's a sort of fuel because it brings up positive emotions if you pick the right thing and it brings up values uh, in every room, like reading about somebody you admire. So I just uh, love this whole realm of art. Uh, Ellen, do you wanna add? Oh, I would, uh, yes, I, I agree with you fully. Harris and I are able to take dance classes online. Our dance studio is going on Facebook 
I guess anybody can take those classes. And we learned a cha-cha routine last night and we practice dance and it, we do it in front of our open window so people can watch us doing salsa or East Coast Swing. And, um, we're at a condo set um, area. But I have classes here. I'm trying to get Harris to take a class on birding. I haven't had any luck in a year. Um, I, you know, Frasier, there's Frasier here. The teaching company has wonderful courses. If you're worried about finances, there's a course on financial literacy that we took, uh, fundamentals of photography, cooking. My daughter loves to cook, playing games. I have a cousin who's playing games in the evening. He works during the day full time, he and his wife. And then in the evening, um, they play games. So listening to music, uh, just the arts are wonderful. And Lisa Van Dam has a program, Read With Me. And if you listen to her Cyrano de Bergerac, you will be transported. You will not, you will not even, um, this will fade into the background, but it's really having a little, I love my, the, the attitude of the person I read earlier who said that he wants to make it feel like a vacation. I don't want to minimize the anxiety and depression or stress people are feeling. I want to give them hope that there's a different way to think about it. And if they can even put a little sparkle in their day with something they love doing, gardening or something, I think, and getting outside a little bit with a mask. Um, and I also, I think that would be great. I also think the word social distancing, someone said it should be physical distancing because we're connecting right now. It's not social distancing, you're physical distancing and socially connecting and connecting. That's another aspect of it. But, Want to talk about that and loneliness and connecting about yeah. uh, the ways you can do that? Oh yeah. I went to a sure. cocktail party. Is that okay then? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I went to a political cocktail party. I don't smoke. I don't smoke cigars or drink. So I felt like a fish out of water and it wasn't my thing. But, you know, who thought of a political cocktail party? I've, um, we've been Zooming with family, the twins that I haven't been able to see in, in months, uh, turned one year old, my grandkid, our grandkids. And we had a big birthday party with the whole family on FaceTime. And that was a blast. My daughter's turning 40 tomorrow. We're planning to have a party for her on FaceTime. Um, we're Zooming. Uh, there are classes you can take on Zoom. You can email. Um, you know, the, it's a wonderful time to stay connected even with people you haven't spoken with in a while. And, you know, I can speak with my daughter-in-law's relatives in Italy. He's a physician in Italy, a cardiologist. Imagine that. So. I was connected with a friend in Italy. I said, "Italy, what? How's he, how are you doing?" He says, yeah. "Well, I'm in a I'm in a house. There's five of us in the house, and we can't leave, but we're making the most of it in every way we can." Yeah, I've made more banana bread than you can believe. <laughs> but anyway, what about uh, you've written about gratitude? How can that help us? Oh, I think it's showing. Um, it's shifting your focus from being a victim, like I can't believe this is happening to me. And if, if all of the thoughts in your mind are negative, you need to first be able to see what losses you have and mourn your losses. You need to honor the fact that, yeah, we all lost a lot of money in the stock market and things look pretty bleak, but also the infrastructure is still there. But you want to have gratitude that we live in this country. It's a much better, it's the best country. Um, and that we still have a good degree of freedom. Uh, gratitude for small things in your life. It could be just looking out. I love seeing the flowers and we live by the ocean. So I love seeing the birds. That's why I want to study the birds. Uh, but just Gratitude, just being aware of what sparkles in your life and what you make sparkle and the people who are good to you. My sisters and I talk all the time. So, and, and yeah, go ahead. Ed. You mentioned to me before a telehealth. Oh, telehealth is available. I know Teladoc uh, through Florida Blue Cross you can get. Um, they've broken down a lot of the boundaries, anybody, and for psych psychological counseling too. 
that you can, you can check on um, your with through your insurance company what's available. Also through your uh, city or town, there may be there's there's I went online to see what's available for people in terms of financial help. Just Google it. You will find so many links for small business loans for. Um, all sorts of help if you need food delivered to you, if, you if you're elderly, and we're all shut in now. They used to call them the shut-ins. We're all shut in. <laughs> but, um, so there's a, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be grateful for and that we can still order things from Amazon. I am stunned that I can still get these <laughs> gloves <laughs> and Purell at the market. We got so excited when we were able to get these little cans of Purell. I'm now washing my oranges, of course, but gratitude is, is important. Ed. It's training your mind to focus. It's, it's what in parenting they call catch the good. Instead of catching your kid do something wrong, you train your mind to catch what your kid's doing well, what they catch the good. And it's with us too, for each of us individually catch the greatness in our life. I mean, I love my husband. I get to spend all day with him. He gets to spend it with me. So I want to uh, remind our audience that we're going to be looking at the questions that you're submitting. And uh, I'm actually going to start to share some of them that have come in already. But before I do that, just let people on uh, Zoom, if you're watching on Zoom, if you hover over your screen, there's a button at the bottom. Uh, it says Q&A. That's the Q&A box. It's the easiest way to send us questions you'd like uh, either Ellen or Ed to answer. We're also looking at the chat, but the Q&A box is the best way to do it. Otherwise, if you are watching on one of our social media channels, Facebook or YouTube uh, or Periscope, we're, we're, we are monitoring those as well. We're looking at the comments sections. So if you uh, add a question in the comment section there, we'll also try to take a look uh, to see what you'd like to ask about. But I do have uh, one question that just came in uh, from Sam on Zoom. Uh, we've been talking about how to deal with our own stress, but especially when we're living in confined quarters with other people, one thing we sometimes also have to deal with is their stress. Uh, and Sam is wondering, how do you deal with external sources of stress, such as stressed out friends, neighbors, and the pushy pushers in grocery stores. What's the best strategy for dealing with other people who are stressed out? Um, watch, I, watch your program, Ben. What's that? Tell them to watch the program if they can get it. Right? Okay. <laughs> uh, Ed, do you want to take? I can answer. Say something afterwards if you Go want. Go ahead. To, and... Go ahead. Okay. Well, your close relationships are really going to be tested. And I know that I've heard that, um, that, uh, that there's been more abuse reported nowadays, domestic abuse. So hopefully that doesn't happen. I thought of that in advance and I thought, what is the one book I could recommend for that? I could recommend our book, The Selfish Path to Romance. But this book teaches communication skills, how to talk so your husband will listen and listen so your husband will talk. It really says how to talk so kids will listen and listen so kids will talk. But the principles apply across the board. And it's a very easy way to learn because things that I love, comics, they have comics throughout to teach the principles which help you retain them. Um, when I used to have pictures of all different weather, like a, a little cards of stormy weather, lightning and sunny weather, partly cloudy, rainy. And I, with clients, I would say, what does it feel like in your home? What climate is it? What's the climate? And they might say stormy. And I'd say, well, what's one thing that would help? You always want to stay solution focused. You can't change another person, but you can look for if a person's saying, I just can't handle this, I'm just super stressed out, maybe they need to be listened to, but you don't wanna to listen to them forever. You want to listen for what's called change talk. For any signs that I'm so stressed out, I don't think I can handle this, but maybe it will be okay. So you're saying maybe it will be okay. What's one thing that you're thinking of that might be a little better? And you help guide them through changing their mood. If it's with kids, again, with my daughter, she said, 
she really values that calmness in the home and the, the loving connection. So she is letting go of some, some rules, like how much screen time a kid can have. Kids can learn a lot of things on TV. I love Daniel Tiger. Well, I love it for my, for my employer, <laughs> you know. There's a, million, there's a million things for kids. I was astonished reading in Wall Street Journal. There's a whole page of things for kids at home. I was, it's amazing. Oh, so much. I have a page here. I do want to mention something that everybody handles their stress uniquely and everybody comes with their own coping strategies. Some of them are not so hot. But um, you want to ask yourself, when have I been through a difficulty before and when did I handle it well? What, did I, what strategies did I use? Um, to the point that everyone handles it uniquely, I went to the supermarket and I said to the, I was wearing gloves and a mask, and no, I was not gloves, just a mask, and got my prop here, my mask, and I, the, I said, I'm not sick. I would say to everyone that saw me, I'm not sick, just to reassure them. And when I got to the cashier, she said, Oh, that's nothing. She said, you should see what we've seen coming through here. You know, I only had a mask. And I said, what do you mean? And she, she said um, that a woman came in covered from head to toe, fully covered I guess, um, with whatever they call it, those, I think one of those uniforms. And then she took the dog collar that you put on a dog collar, a dog after they have surgery, and she was wearing that upside down somehow on her so she couldn't breathe it. They said, as the woman's telling me, it's not funny. She was cracking up laughing, just remembering the imagery of it, as was the bagger at the supermarket. So I think you need to respect yourself that if you have somebody in your house, like my sisters look at me as um, that I'm the one that's more cautious. They can go out, they can do things, and they're changing their tune now. But, but I didn't mind if they wanted to see me that way, they can typecast me. But just respect people's uniqueness, uniqueness Ben, and try to get a nice climate in the house, learning new community, look, looking at it as an opportunity to learn new communication skills. So you, you mentioned uh, the resources that are available for children. And you also mentioned that for those of us who are trying to deal with stress one way, to do that is to think about how we've dealt with it before. Yes. Uh, but of course, young children haven't dealt with a lot of stress before. This whole situation is very new to them. Uh, they probably never lived through anything like this before. Uh, do you have any recommendations for how, how, to, how to help children specifically through this kind of situation, which is for them I mean, for many of us, it's unprecedented, but but for them especially. I think two things. Make it age appropriate uh, with what you tell them about the germ, the virus, and also make it interesting at home. It'll be making it interesting for yourself and interesting for them. So you can vary it. You can you try different things with them. You might try a, a tour. Th um, I know somebody's giving, Luke Travers is giving, um, art lessons, touching the art for children. A really cute picture here that you may or may not be able to see. Um, but you can try that. If it works with your child, fine. If not, they might have their own resources. They can connect with friends. Um, but make their days and your own days interesting. That would be my keyword. I don't know. Make it, an, make it an adventure as much as you can with a child, such as I'm going to teach you to cook today. That's just one example. Right. That's what my daughter said. Yeah. Yeah. She said instead of trying to do math, which she is doing and teaching him the alphabet, he's a four year old, she's, um, and teaching him phonics. She said, I'm teaching, you know, you can teach how to fold clothes, how to, uh, just household activities of daily living and make it fun. That's the key to make it fun and to have a really nice sense of humor about it. So you mentioned a lot of, uh, chat questions are you going to decide which ones you want us to answer yeah we are we're definitely uh watching those as they come through okay. um and some of them are, are people who are talking with each other too so okay. it's um it's, you mentioned that when we're uh, talking with children about this we need to do it 
in a way that's age appropriate. Um, but I, I assume that you would you would agree that it's still important to uh, tell children the truth about what's oh, going on in the absolutely. world. And so can you can you say something about what's the way what's the best way to do that? What's the best way to help children understand what's going on in the world, help help them know that it's a real problem, but not in a way that that scares them to death. Turn off the news. You feel if they're younger children, turn off the news. You're going to be there there. Turn it off for yourself too. You don't want to watch the news all day. Right, right. That's like right. And I had been doing that at the beginning, and I now put on music during the day, and I practice dance. But uh, for getting back to the question of the um, children, my daughter has said, you know, it's a germ, and we we wash our hands, and she's she's made it fun to wash her hands and to go out. You know, they they don't they just ride a little bike around their block, so they don't do that much. But um, I don't think they're wearing masks at this point because nobody else is out. But if they have questions, you answer them in an appropriate way for a four-year-old. Why can't grandma come visit us for your birthday, mom? Um, well, we have to wait for this germ to stop. When will that happen, mom? We don't know yet, honey. But it's scary. I'm afraid of germs. Tell me about that, honey. You need to listen to what the content in their mind is. Well, I'm afraid it's going to kill you and daddy or me. Um, well, you know, we're doing everything right, honey. We're washing our hands. We're doing things. And, you know, I don't think that's, I think you're very, we're very safe. We're doing the right things. Now, you can't promise that, but you don't want to give a child who can't, who doesn't even know how to deal with death you know, that content at four years old. As they get older, they will ask questions and you can, um, you can give them information about germs and success stories in the past. And that scientists are working on this, very bright people are working on this. And we've been able to solve this problem with, uh, it depends on their age, because you don't want to put negative thoughts in their mind, but with polio or with German measles or mumps or, you know, you can talk about, we just take a little, I just took a little sugar pill and I had, didn't have to worry about polio anymore. That's what the doctors are working on now. You know, you can give them some, go ahead, Ed. If you want to do gratitude, uh, kids don't know how fantastic it is that we're living in this century. Uh, almost all the major advances in medicine were late mid mid 1800s or later and mostly in the 20th century for all the diseases and operations and pills and antibiotics it's fantastic and we can be certain they're going to figure out a way to stop this virus because we're it's not in the middle we're not in the mid 1500s anymore so you can give kids a sense of optimism right you wow can. what a great time to be living right Right, and that doctors are really, um, uh, I don't want to use challenge, but excited about finding the solution to this, just like they did with the other things. You know, when you get a cold and we take you into see the, the Minute Clinic at CVS, um, well, they, they're, they're looking for medicine. With that medicine helped you a lot, honey, with your earache. With, they're looking for medicine to do the same thing. And, um, and we're really happy, you know, there, you know, who's a doctor who's working on this, if you know anybody or, and you can give a little bit of the positive news. Now, if somebody dies in the family, you have to deal with that. I didn't mean to turn this dark suddenly, but you have to deal with that too. Like my father's 93 and my uncle, whom I adore is 90. I don't know if they'll make it through this crisis. And that is, um, it's a reality, but I'm not going to tell that to my kids. You know, it hasn't happened. They may make it through and I may not. And that's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm not going to let that happen. But... So uh, shifting gears just a little bit, we're getting, there's a question that came in from an anonymous uh, viewer on Zoom yeah. who says, and uh, you've addressed this to some extent already, but I think there's probably more to say. They, uh, they say this situation is particularly stressful for people who live alone since their human interactions normally occur outside their home, whereas others at least have their family or significant others to dance with. Any advice for them? And here I'm thinking, 
So you, you, you have talked about opportunities for connecting on Zoom or FaceTime uh, or talking on the phone. Uh, but I imagine part of the reason this person's asking the question is, is for people who live alone, especially, uh, that that's only so much consolation that they can connect electronically. And so there's still there's a lot that they're still missing out. And, uh, for, you know, from actual social interactions in person. And they miss out on touch, don't they? Yeah. I mean, touch is so important when you shake hands with people. You miss out on that. Um, so if you're if you are alone, oh, you can look at it either as um, I know I haven't. My uncle says he's a natural introvert. He reads Scientific Americans and he's absolutely fine. This fits in with the course of his life, with the pace of it. But if you are home alone, you either can put, um, you can reach out to people if you are internet savvy, um, who you haven't connected with. My father connected, my mother's been deceased for a few years. He connected with a, an, a girlfriend's sister. They were twins. <laughs> and he's been talking with her regularly at the age of 93. He's got a girlfriend on the internet. But he's home mostly alone. Um, he's got some help, but my uncle's home mostly alone. But you can, you want to bring in your values. What can you do to make your day interesting? And how can you get that social connection um, just uh, through any people that you know, your family members? It's up to you to do that. Nobody can do that for you. But you don't want to get into a victim mentality of nothing's happening. Like the guy next door, what are you doing? I'm aging. Now, I'm sure he's connecting with his family rather than just growing old. Uh, but, um, and they can watch funny things, too. You know, just um, or uh, even going online and listening to a little bit of the news, the positive news. My sister sent me a link that was like good news. I don't think it was a religious link, but just good news. And they every day they would put on what vaccines or what, what people were working on. You could collect just the good news um, or you could go online. And this is something I would recommend for everyone. It's just really cute. The Rotterdam Symphony Orchestra, there's a link to it. Um, you can actually um, watch one person start with, I think, a cello and then just see what happens. It's going viral, so you'll probably find it. Um, and they can do exercises online. I feel like I'm with somebody. I've been doing exercises online for years, Pilates and yoga with two people who don't know me. Um, it's just a YouTube that they made, but I feel like I'm in their class and there are live classes now too. So getting exercise is really important for, for managing your mood too. So that, that last point in particular is a way of connecting with people virtually, but also also making it physical in a way. Right. Uh, even though you still can't actually. There was a question on who do you believe. Now, here's something about the free press. All programs and newspapers have an agenda, which not, may not always be truth is king. They have an agenda of supporting somebody, attacking somebody. But that's a good thing, because if you use a little bit of variety, you can get a view and a counter view. And usually you can figure out sooner or later what's the most accurate, especially when you can find the names of respected people. So uh, you can't expect the news to be always perfect, but freedom of speech is a great thing. And it's possible to put the pieces together if you watch some stuff, but not too much. So you don't get depressed. Yeah, I, I take it you're talking about Gail's uh, question in the chat. And so yes. since, since you brought that up, I might as well mention, I actually did a talk on this subject oh. a few years ago at Ocon, and you can find it on YouTube. It's called How to Be Objective About the News. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think this is this is one of the ways in which um, we do have some control. Uh, we can we, we can be the ones to judge the reliability of what we're hearing. And it's especially important because I think there is there are people who are there are people in the media who are overly hysterical. There are also people in the media who are too dismissive about yep. the problems that we're dealing with today. Yep. And it, you know, to go to back to Ellen's chart, it is, I think it's really important to understand that it's, it's going to be somewhere in between and that you need to exercise some critical thinking that, skills. Absolutely. To see that. A very good point. By the way, there was a question on the chat about the song I mentioned. Yeah. Drink to me only 
with thine eyes. And you can just put it in your search thing on your computer and it will come up with various singers. Uh, and if you keep searching, you'll find the probably a six of them and you can pick your favorite. I, I think picking your favorites in art is a fantastic thing to do. And Ellen, we also got a question from another person in Zoom, uh, with Judith, uh, asking about the sculpture behind you. I just, I saw that, I haven't been monitoring the chat, I don't have that screen up, but I saw that pop up at the beginning. That is called Harmony, and it's by Carl Jensen. Um, uh, uh, I, we, we got it through Quaint Cordia's uh, Fine Art Gallery, but we love that. When we, when we thought we were having a going to be hit by a hurricane. That is the one item I wanted to say. I love that statue. So I, I move so you guys can see it a little better. This is, uh, we have about 15 minutes left. And so I'll I, I encourage people again, if, you, if there are any last questions that you want to ask, uh, please plug those into the Q&A box or into the comment sections on, on social media. But uh, we did get one question from Chuck that I th uh, Chuck on Zoom, who I think this is probably the best question that we could start to wrap things up with uh, that I've seen. And Chuck asked, do you have any suggestions for people who would like to speak to professional therapists uh, at this time? Now, I, uh, I know there, there, there must be telemedicine versions of therapy that are available, yes. but there are so many therapists out there who are offering their services how do you how do you choose how do you and how do you where do you go first to look for one that's a very good question alan go ahead <laughs> it's a very good question um well i used to do the teletherapy um i know that there are two objectivists who still i uh michael hurd and steve orma who i think offered the teletherapy i would also recommend uh gene maroney binswanger's thinkingdirections.com um it's not therapy but it she gives you incredible thinking skills and methods to manage your own mind um but so that's an option i you can um I mean, I would look for an object if I if there were, if I were looking for a therapist for myself, and there wasn't one who knew my philosophy, I would try to find a good cognitive therapist. And I would, um, you always, it's just like any doctor, I once went to a doctor, and he came over to me to remove something on my skin. And he said, Now, this is really going to hurt. <laughs> As opposed to saying, Ellen, sing a song. Oh, it's gone. You know? So you really want to judge your therapist. Is there an emotional connection with your therapist? Do you feel there's chemistry there? Um, this is really an important point you're making because how a therapist labels themselves, I'm Freudian, Neo-Freudian, uh, Skinnerian, Rogerian, doesn't mean very much. You really have to know whether they listen, whether they understand you, whether they can tell you something you didn't already know that would be beneficial. And so don't be, don't be misled by labels. If, they, if they're making nonsense, uh, then go to someone else. Yeah, you can and change. Uh, some therapists have very small toolbox, very small toolbox. So see if they can really understand you and make sense of what you're talking about. And if you don't like it, go to someone else. Also, David Burns wrote a book. Um, I don't agree with everything in it, um, but it's on anxiety and panic. Um, so if you're feeling really anxious, it really covers depression and everything. And I just drew a blank. Uh, it'll come back. I'm very good to myself when I forget something. I just say, oh, well, <laughs> it'll come back. On that topic of, of anxiety, yeah. Uh, we had a couple questions come in. Uh, one was from Wendy, who says uh, she's been having difficulty concentrating on anything oh, lately. There was another person who asked, uh, I lost the question, but they were asking about having trouble falling asleep at night. Uh, any any insight there that you could uh, offer? I could, uh, concentrating, the person who runs our whole complex here, she said, I had the, you know, I was set Sunday, 
I'm just walking around in a daze and I tried to be productive. I could not focus. I could not concentrate. That's the trauma of this. Your mind needs to process that we are in a very traumatic situation. I mean, we can we cocoon ourselves and we can live within our values. This is a bizarre situation. I mean, this, uh, if you just give me a moment here on crisis management, I've done a bunch with crisis management, but I'll tell you the factors that um, if, if these factors are uncertain, the, the intensity of your stress will be more. Location, where is this happening? It's worldwide. Preventability, how preventable is this? You can't just move to another town. How predictable is it? We don't know when the end is with this. How intense is it? You know, that it happens so fast, it's very intense. We have a 24 seven news cycle. What is the scope of the damage? Oh my God, I don't even wanna go there. You know, there's so much damage being done economically. And what is the duration? Well, yeah, that's a big question. When are we going to have a vaccine in a year? So it's very easy and don't beat up on yourself if you get into the mindset of just worrying about things. You do want to break that mindset because you want your life back again. You want to sparkle in your life. And think and of, think of if you're worrying, are there any actions I can take or can I reframe the situation from what I thought it was uh, that, that may be keeping you awake at night? Now, supposing, supposing your worry is economic, which is hurting millions of people. Um, we mentioned websites. There's lots of places you can get economic advice because there's about a million things going on in the governments, local and national. So there are things you can do and a lot of places are even hiring uh, million, thousands and thousands of people. So try to think, all right, is there any action I could take to deal with this? And this is one of the, oh, go ahead, Ed. Go ahead. Oh, this is one of the things you want to gradually, it may not happen overnight. You may need to do what's, I love the book, Mind Over Mood by uh, Dennis Greenberger and Christine Podetsky. They teach a method called a thought record. And the thought record will help you take any distorted thinking that you have, which may not be a lot of distorted thinking if you're anxious, but they help you reframe it to, um, a, like I once woke up one morning and my tongue was pitch black. I knew I was dying, but I'm cool, I'm calm, I'm collected, I'm a scientist. I took notes of all of my symptoms. I had a legal pad. The legal pad was full. I was getting tingling in my fingers. I was so sleepy. I didn't think at any, I knew I was, I knew I was going to lose my tongue to tongue cancer. Fast forward, I'm making this story very short. It, I went to the doctor and she asked me, did you have any PB? It was Pepto-Bismol. I had chewed those little pink things. They stayed on my tongue at night. The minute she just hit me playfully and said, you're perfectly healthy, I'm gonna get out of here. And here I had myself dying losing my husband, losing every value. I had catastrophized. And all those symptoms I had, I looked at her and I said, well, what are these symptoms? They were all symptoms of anxiety and um, all of the physiological responses of anxiety and depression, the sleepiness, the tingliness, the jitteriness, and all that went away. So you, you, need, to, you need to have a method to... Um, there was a question on the vitamins. Uh, I've studied vitamins for like 30 years, be very careful about getting too excited about vitamins. Almost none of them have uh, controlled, placebo controlled causal studies. And most vitamins, if you eat healthily, are all you need. Uh, take vitamin C, somebody mentioned vitamin C. If you eat decent food, you don't need vitamin C. Uh, you're not gonna get scurvy. And vitamin C doesn't cure everything. Out of 25 years work, the only thing I've concluded was the best one to take is vitamin D3. That's it. Sunshine. That's the only one I'm convinced I should take. And other ones I've just stopped taking them uh, okay. because just the evidence isn't, that, isn't there. So one thing that we, we didn't uh, spend much time talking about is the 
and and for good reason, I think, but it is the political uh, angle of this. And we got one question, though, from Laurie, which I think connects the political with the psychological, uh, because one of the things about this situation that makes it especially stressful is, is it's not oh. just a virus, it's the way our society is reacting to it. And, and Laurie asks, what do you tell people that chafe at being ordered to stay at home? I think this is, uh, and she says it's, uh, it's, it's it's good to wear seatbelts, but being ordered to is really hard, she says. And then this is a like like bigger that. version of that. Yeah. Um, normally, it would be a terrible thing for the government to do. The pandemic is different because public health is a legitimate government function because it's dealing with pandemics, basically. When you have a pandemic, individual decisions may not be the right thing to do because you have to have a system that everyone works with, such as staying at home. If there's no vaccine, the pandemic will just start killing people. So in, a, in an emergency, it's, it's, like a, it's like a curfew. You have rioting in the streets and the government says, you cannot be out after six o'clock. In that context, it's legitimate. It's the right thing to do. So, so hold, in, hold in mind, in emergencies, the government can do things ordinarily couldn't do and shouldn't do. In this case, I think it's correct. Because if you care a carrier, you're inadvertently using force against innocent people. You can be a carrier with no symptoms, and you can harm and even kill other people, not even intending to. So I would say the government's policies of isolation is totally legitimate. And uh, you should uh, go along with that. And Eventually, they'll have a vaccine, but right now, the only protection other than washing your hands is isolation. So I'm not opposed to them doing that at all. In fact, I'm very, very furious to read about ministers and choir masters who have hundreds of people coming for choir practice and services and everyone in there getting sick and some of them dying because that was a stupid thing to do. And some of them are being arrested and they should be. So I'm all for government ordering in an emergency if it's a reasonable thing to do given the facts. And I should, I should mention that uh, we had a dis uh, more general discussion about this at last week's uh, Wednesday webinar on the role of government during a health crisis with Ankar Gatte and, and Greg Salmieri. And we, we definitely talked about the legitimate role government has in uh, the power of quarantine. I think one of the things we talked about is there's, there's, there are a number of questions to be asked about what kind of, uh, what the proper uh, level of that power is and what kind of justification that needs to be given uh, for raising it to certain levels. So I, I do suggest people take a look at that uh, discussion. Right. We're yeah, almost, really. we're almost at the end of our time. So, uh, was there anything that either of you uh, wanted to uh, close with? Uh, any any last thoughts? Well, do the obvious things that, are, that will protect you and then do things that give you happiness in life insofar as you can control those things. Ellen? I, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I think it's letting go of what you can't control. Like I recognize that I am not at the... I'm not in charge of politics, so I can listen twice a day. I can get the daily rounds from a company called STAT, which Amish, uh, Dr. Adjula recommended, but I, I, I need to let go of some of that and then enjoy things that I do enjoy. Here's, um, you know, I might make another book for, this is for a book that, a photo book of my grandchild. I may make another book. You know, you find what you love doing, what you've always said, I wish I had more time to do X, Y, Z, even if it's cleaning your desk, even if it's shredding old papers or some fun things like gardening, you know, it gives you a sense of efficacy. It gives you a sense of being in charge. So it's like the serenity prayer, let go of the things that you can't immediately control and embrace the things you can control and, um, and try to make the most of a difficult situation and be very good to yourself if you're feeling anxious or depressed. You don't wanna stay there. You want to gently help yourself as you would a best friend.
Okay, so uh, on that note, I do want to just mention that uh, if you're in Zoom, I'm going to go ahead and launch a, a quick poll. This webinar is sponsored by the Ayn Rand Institute, the uh, mission of which is to educate people about Ayn Rand's philosophy. Uh, we just wanted to check in with people on Zoom to see where you're coming from, uh, what your level of familiarity with Ayn Rand is. I'll leave that on in the background, though, because I think uh, what I need to do to wrap things up right now is to, first of all, thank both of you, Ellen and Ed, thank uh, you. for sharing thank you. with us some, I think, really valuable advice. I hope that uh, that this uh, is, is, uh, gives some of our audience some tools uh, for dealing with what is, by all accounts, uh, a really daunting and unprecedented world situation. And just, uh, uh, I'll, I'll also tell the audience that uh, at the Ayn Rand Institute, we are going to be here for some time now to come to be commenting on uh, the pandemic crisis. We are, if anything, ramping up our production of content and uh, we'll be in the same space featuring more and more live uh, commentary, webinars, interviews. And so if you're, if you're looking for more guidance, if you're looking for more clarity on understanding what's happening in the world through a philosophic lens, please stay tuned for more information coming from us. We're going to have uh, a lot more to show uh, in the future. And, and I, do wish, I do wish the best to all of you who are out there uh, dealing with the stress that you have to deal with. And uh, we, we are with you and I hope you'll be with us. So thank you. Uh, thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. And thank yeah. you everyone.